How you doing, everyone? Welcome to the best real estate investing advice ever show. We've got follow along Friday. We're going to be talking about, well, the way you can lose money in apartment syndication, one of the ways, and that's the execution. So we don't want you to lose money, we want you to make money. So we're going to be talking about ways to um, um, help get your deals funded properly. And then we'll briefly touch on some execution points, but all of that is in the book. Um, so we'll go ahead and dive right in. Um, if you've got any questions, comments, as always, <clears throat> write them below in the, the Facebook, underneath the Facebook Live video, or if you're watching on YouTube, just comment below and we'll be happy to address them um, on a future episode. Best ever listeners, how you doing? Welcome to the best real estate investing advice ever show. I'm Joe Fairless. This is the world's longest running daily real estate investing podcast. We only talk about the best advice ever. We don't get into any of that fluffy stuff. And today is follow along Friday. We're going to be talking about the fourth part of doing an apartment syndication. And if you are just joining us, then, uh, well, we got three other conversations that I recommend you listen to. Uh, the first one was about uh, the experience, how you get the experience you need in order to do a syndication. The second part is money, how you attract private money. The third is deal. How do you uh, attract deals constantly to you? And um, then how do you run the numbers on those deals? And now the fourth, you've successfully done the first three. You've got the experience. You got the money. You got the uh, deals. Now, how do you actually execute? And um, before you can actually execute, well, you got to actually secure the money. Um, and there are two main components of that. One is debt and the other is equity. So we're, Theo and I are going to be talking about um, some ways to secure the debt and the equity and some things you should think about. And then um, yesterday, I got our book in the mail. And Theo, I'm so proud of this thing. I mean, this, uh, th this puppy, look, I, I think we're, is this showing up on camera, Theo? Yeah, I can see it. There we go. Yeah. And for everyone listening on the podcast, well, we got a YouTube channel. You can, you can see it, but um, it's, it's, it's something that will be very helpful for a lot of people um, who, well, I don't know about a lot of people because apartment syndication is a very narrowly focused um, uh, business model. But for everyone who is doing apartment syndication, I'm confident that will be very helpful uh, for you. And so we'll kick it off today and start talking about um, getting the money. Exactly. So as Joe mentioned, uh, at this point in the process, we have the deal under contract. And before you close on the deal, you need to do two things. Number one, you need to perform due diligence, which we're not going to talk about um, on this episode because we've actually done dedicated two podcasts to going over the due diligence, which is episodes um, 1116 and 1130. So the first one we go over what these documents, uh, what the due diligence, what, do, what due diligence document do you get? And the second one, we talk about how much it costs, which is important, of course. Nice work having those episodes handy, Theo. Appreciate <laughs> that. I learned from the best, Joe. <laughs> uh, and, and then secondly, uh, while you're doing that, you need to secure, um, you need to secure the financing for this actual deal. So typically when you think of real estate, you'll get a, a loan from the bank and then either you, you, you yourself will fund the down payment. Well, since you're syndicating this deal, uh, part of the money will still come from the bank and the other part will come from your passive investors. So in regards to uh, securing finance from, from the bank, there's a couple of things you need to do um, in order to, to accomplish that. So this is when you are reaching out to the, the lender and asking them what type of, you know, what type of loan program you can qualify for and um, whether or not you or the deal can actually qualify for the, um, will qualify for financing. So there are four things you need to do. Uh, the first thing is you need to put together a, a biography. And this is a biography for, biography for yourself and for everyone else that's involved in the deals, your management company, um, if you have a, a mentor, um, anyone who's involved in a deal, a sponsor, uh, they, 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 they wanna know who these people are, what their relationship is to you, what their background is, and how, that, and how the, all those three together relates to the, the deal in question. Because when you are 
you know, one of the things that the lender will is going to look at is is the actual person they're loaning they're they're um they're they're loaning to, and they want to know that this person is going to be able to execute in the business plan so they can make their money back. And so they so they want to know who's involved in the deal, um, so that they can make that decision. So that's number one. Um, you need bios. Number two, they're going to ask you for the um, financial statements for the actual property. So it, it, it varies from lender to lender, but generally you're gonna have to send them the historical profit and loss for the last 12, 12, to three, 12 months to, to three years, usually 12 months. And then they're also gonna want a, a rent roll for the, a current rent roll for the property. Um, now sometimes, you know, the, the lender might look at trailing three months for some things or the trailing one month for other things. But just in general, they're gonna ask you for those two documents and then um, they're going to essentially underwrite the deal themselves to make sure that going in, the uh, debt service coverage ratio is above a certain threshold um, when they, so that they know that you could cover the, the mortgage payments with the, the current income. And what are the thresholds that are typical? So for, for agency debt, it's usually 1.25. So they want to see a debt. So, so essentially what that means is that the, the NOI is 125% of the debt service. So they know that no matter what, so not no matter what, but so they know that they're, co they're competent in your ability to pay back the, the debt service because you've got that 25% buffer between the NOI and the debt service. Um, and then for, for, for bridge loans, sometimes it's, it's the same, sometimes it's 1.1. It kind of just depends on the lender. And so these are all things that you want to ask um, your, your, your mortgage broker or your lender because it, it varies. But for agency debt, it's, it's usually 1.25. And what's agency debt? Uh, that would be, well, we're actually gonna, we're actually gonna go into it. We'll go that in a little bit. We're gonna go in the, in the second part. So that's number two, the, the, you need a profit and loss statement and a rent roll. Number three is they're also going to want your budget and your business plan. So they know how the property is currently operating, but they want to know how it's going to be operating after you take over the property. Also, and also what you plan on doing to the property. So as a value add investor, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to send them your stabilized expenses. You're going to send them your stabilized rents and revenue line items. And you're also going to want to send them your capital expenditure budget so they can review all of that and make sure that again, once all those are done, will you still, you know, are, are those assumptions accurate, number one? And number two, will you still be able to, you know, pay the debt service once the property is stabilized? So that's number three. And then finally, they're also going to want the personal financial statements from each person, essentially everyone who's signing on the loan. So, um, and I'm, I'm actually going, I actually went through this process a couple of a weeks ago talking to brokers and uh, mortgage brokers and sometimes they'll, they'll want you to send it to them before you have a deal just to expedite the process and they're not it's just one less thing you have to do when you actually find a deal um, but what's uh, one of the one of the benefits of doing it beforehand is you can see how much debt you qualify for and based off of your net worth and your liquidity and if you you know can qualify for a one million dollar loan but your plan is to buy a $10 million property, then you're gonna to have to bring on a loan guarantor. And a loan guarantor is someone who meets those liquidity and net worth requirements. Usually it's 100%, uh, their net worth's equal to 100% of the loan balance and your uh, liquidity is 10% of the, um, the loan balance at close. And you'll find that person and they'll sign the loan, qualify, help you qualify for the loan, and in return you'll compensate them either uh, a one-time fee at closing or a percentage of the general partnership, depending on the type of, of debt that's being secured. And or could be both. Yeah. And what, one thing to mention on the financial statements that are being submitted, anyone, not only for a loan guarantor, but anyone who has 20% or more ownership yeah, yeah. Uh, in the deal. And so that's why as general partners, when we uh, send the offer or send the opportunity out to our private investors, we cap the amount that any one investor can invest at 19% of whatever the equity is. So for example, where we've got a deal, um, the equity raise is 21.5 million, 
we capped it at a little over four million dollars, oh. um, so that they stayed under the twenty percent um, trigger, so that uh, it didn't. Um, what it does is it, it triggers the know your customer clause with the lender and then they're underwritten and you know, the passive investors, at least our passive investors don't want to go through that process because it defeats the purpose of being passive. Exactly. Yeah. So for, so for those four things that I mentioned the, the bio, the biographies, the financial statements for the actual deal, your, or your, and, or your loan guarantor financial statements, and then the budget and the business plan. These are all things that you want to, at least discuss with your mortgage broker before you actually find a deal. You don't want to just do this after you find a deal and you know, send, them all, send them all the bios, send them all the financial statements. Obviously you can't send them the, um, your, and well also for your business plan and your, and your, and the actual deal financial statements, you can send those to the, the mortgage broker beforehand as, as well. And so they can tell you, you know, ballpark the um, type of, of loan, the type of, of debt you can qualify for. Um, most of the mortgage brokers I've spoken with, have, have had no, no issue with me sending them all of these things as long as I don't do it for, you know, every single deal and never close on a deal. So got to keep that in mind too. And in addition to financial statements, you'll want to have your uh, real estate owned schedule complete. And that basically shows how much real estate you currently own. And there's, um, you know, shows the debt that you have on it when you bought it. Um, what's the, if it's an apartment building, what's the NOI, um, who's the loan with, when's the loan due, what percent ownership do you have in the deal, and ultimately what your, um, your equity is worth in that mm -hmm. deal. And if you, so you're going to be asked that, so you, you might want to have that prepared um, now and then just add to it and update it whenever you do get a deal. Um, also, from a liquidity standpoint, they're going to want to see a bank statement for the last within the last 60 days mm -hmm. that shows whatever your liquidity is. So if you know you're going to be buying a property in the next four to five months, just keep that in mind that you're going to need to provide a bank statement uh, for the last 30 to 60 days of whatever you have. And that's what you're going to be showing them. Uh, whenever you close. So if you need to um, be more cash heavy during that period of time, then, then, you know, approach accordingly. Exactly. So that's the first part of the financing is the, 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 the debt from a lender. And the second portion is going to be the money you raise from your passive investors. So a rule of thumb is that uh, you, a rule of thumb of how much money you're likely going to need to raise um, it'll be approximately 30 to 35% of the total project costs. So the, you know, you, so, you know you're going to have your LTV and you might have to put 20% down for the actual loan, but you might have to raise you know, the additional money for the acquisition fee, for the operating account fund, for closing costs, financing fees. If you have to pay for innovations out of pocket, there's money for that. So a good rule of thumb is 30 to 35% of the total project costs. Now, there are actually two main types of, of, of equity um, that you can, you can raise, or I guess these are two different ways you can structure with your investors. So number one is the, the equity, which is the most, um, is the, uh, the most common. And that is when you, you raise capital from passive investors, you offer them a preferred return, and they will participate in the upside of the deal. So there will be some sort of profit split where they will make a percentage of the sales proceeds. So that's number one. And number two, there's also a, a, a different kind that, that um, is, 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 is similar to actual debt. And when this, in, uh, if, in this situation, you'll raise money from, a, from passive investors, but, it, but they won't participate in the upside of the deal, just like a lender doesn't participate in the upside of the deal. Instead, they will receive a, a higher ongoing return. Um, it's, it's, I've actually learned that it's called the, the coupon rate. And uh, essentially, they'll get an interest rate on their money for a specific period of time, um, whatever you agree to. And then once that, you know, that, once that, that period of time is over, you will return the capital to them, whether it's through a, a refinance or a supplemental loan. And then 
you as a syndicator own the deal free and clear. Now, from my understanding, uh, talking to a, a few mortgage brokers, um, you can either do one or the other. So you can either have all equity or, or all debt. Um, usually the, the debt works better if you have a, only a, few, a handful of investors that are investing a lot of money as opposed to someone who's investing, you know, 50 grand. But you could also do a, a combination of the, of the two. You could have the majority of the, the capital come from a debt investor, let's say 80, 90 percent. And then the remaining 20 to 10 to 20 percent can, can be equity investors where you raise, you know, 50 grand here, 100 grand here from, from people to, to fill the uh, fill up the remaining um, equity. So basically what I'm saying is, it, it's, it's, uh, is it, there's unlimited ways that you can structure these, these, uh, these types of deals. And so make sure that you are, are having a conversation with your investors so you know what types of returns they want and what type of, you know, what type of returns they want and kind of structure they want. Um, and also have a, a conversation with, with your um, attorney who's gonna be creating this operating agreement between you and your investors. Because if they are an apartment syndicator specialist, which they should be, they will have experience creating all types of operating agreements and they can give you an understanding of, of how to approach it. Um, I actually had a conversation with a couple of real estate attorneys uh, this past week, and they recommended that we start simple and just start with just raising equity, just doing the equity where you offer a preferred return and then upside in sale, uh, upside uh, an upside at sale. But as we you know grow, we could create more and more complicated um, deal structures based off of you know if we have one big investor or you know we find a certain type of deal, um, things like that. I just wanted to mention that before we get into actually how to secure the, the capital and the process for doing so. So the process for securing capital, um, we have a, a four step process for, for doing so. Um, the first step after you have a deal under contract is to create an investment summary. So an inv Oh, you, you paused because that was my cue to start talking, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, I did. <laughs> All right, I'll talk about this. But I was waiting. You said you were going to mention agency debt and bridge debt, mm. and you you, didn't, you never you didn't talk about. It. So can you quickly define those two and talk about it? Uh, yeah. So agency debt is essentially permanent long term financing. So this is debt from Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, and the terms can be five, seven, ten, or twelve years. And this is the, the, the set it and forget it debt. So you'll get your, your debt, you'll have a preferably a fixed interest rate. Sometimes it might be floating. Um, you'll have a, a, a specified LTV and debt service coverage ratio. You'll get your loan and you won't, you'll pay the same payment for, for the, the length of the, the term. Unless of course you get interest only, which means you'll pay paying a little bit less up front. The point is, is that this is a longer, a, term, a loan that's longer term in nature. So you can, you know, based off of how long you plan on holding the property, you're going to get your, um, you're going to make sure that your, your loan term is longer than that. So if you plan on holding for you know, five years, you want to loan that's five or more years, seven years, seven or more years. Bridge, uh, a, a, a bridge loan, on the other hand, is shorter term in nature. So they'll be, they could be as low as six months and up to three years. And then you'll usually have an option to buy extensions of six months to know two one-year extensions so it is possible to extend it out to up to five years um, but oh uh, you're essentially you're gonna get a bridge loan when the uh, deal doesn't qualify for permanent financing so if, if you remember what I mentioned earlier it needs to have a debt service coverage ratio of 1.25 and it needs to have a I can't remember exactly what it is but it needs to have a um, a, a certain um, a, a certain occupancy rate. I, I, can't, I can't remember exactly what it is. It might have been 80 to 85 percent, but it needs to be above a certain economic occupancy rate, or it won't qualify for for permanent financing. And if that's the case. Your other option is a bridge loan, which is shorter term in nature. It allow you to cover the um, renovation costs. And so instead of it being an LTV, a loan to value loan, it'll be actually be a loan to cost um, loan. So you'll figure out what the purchase price is plus all the capital expenditures. And then they'll fund a percentage of that, and then they'll provide you with withdrawals for the renovations along the way. But essentially, the main the main difference is the length. So the, the agency debt are longer term in nature, and then 
Uh, number two is the types of deals that qualify um, type of deals that qualify for this financing. So if the if it's uh, if the deal is essentially stabilized, uh, you can uh, qualify for agency debt. If not, bridge loan is your other option. Yeah, and uh, interest rates will be higher for bridge loans. Your um, your leverage will be can be lower for bridge loans. Uh, so if you were um, reckless and you just wanted to juice your return, so increase your returns as much as possible for every single deal, you just do bridge loans and you'd uh, interest only bridge loans. And you'd look to exit out in you know, two years and then you just keep doing that. But the problem is they're riskier and you really should do them just for value add deals. Uh, the one way they're riskier is let's say you are doing renovations and your renovations are not going as planned. Uh, well, there are certain loan covenants with any loan, um, things you have to adhere to during the course of ownership in order to continue to be in good standing with the lender. And with a bridge loan, as Theo mentioned, you are... Uh, not receiving the um, CapEx funds at the beginning, but rather you're receiving them in draw periods, just like a fix and flipper would receive it from a private money lender. They show that they did the work, send pictures, and uh, show reports and re proof of the work being done, and then you get reimbursed. Well, on an apartment community, if things aren't going as planned or you have a downturn in the economy or whatever takes place, any number of circumstances can take place and your occupancy dips below a certain level or your um, debt service coverage ratio dips below whatever level um, or, you know, collections dips below a certain level, whatever the covenants are in place with the lender. Well, guess what? They're not going to send you the, the money to reimburse you for the work that you've done. And that's a problem. That's a huge problem for you. And you're going to have to either front the money um, or you're going to have to do a capital call or you're going to let the project sink. Uh, so there's more risk involved with a bridge loan, significantly more risk. Uh, so while you can get higher returns, there's uh, significantly more a risk involved, so you'll want to be very um, judicious with how you um, pick your loan options. Exactly, and 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 you are able to get um, some capital expenditures covered in agency debt. Um, essentially, what they do is they'll again provide you a loan as low as one point two five debt service coverage ratio. So, if at the current purchase price, without including renovations, it's above that, then you can increase that. That, that, that the size of your loan until it hits that 1.25 and then whatever extra you have on top above the purchase price can go towards renovations. That's how you can, that's how you can get around um, funding at least a portion of your renovations with agency debt. Whereas for the bridge loan, they'll just do it based off of the loan to cost. There is a debt service coverage ratio um, requirement. I think it's 1.1. Um, so it's, it's, it's much lower. Um, because because they're expecting you because they they understand that deals distress and that it's gonna the NOI it's going to increase over time, which is why it's important that you have a, a solid business plan to show them. Um, but it is possible to have renovations covered with agency debt too. Cool. And now on the equity side, real quick, equity side, the process for securing the capital because Theo just talked about debt, and now there's equity um, to secure with your private investors. Uh, four steps, four step process for securing the capital. This assumes, by the way, that you've already done the, the legwork to uh, cultivate your network, your position as a thought leader, you have the team in place to um, have the credibility and the experience to execute on the business plan. So this, this assumes all those other things are in place. Now you've got the deal. And what do you do? Well, you create an investment summary. Um, uh, there are m many things you can include in the investment summary. Uh, there, the legal documents, which are the, the private placement memorandum, the operating agreement, the subscription agreement, and a couple other things, 
they will have all the details and then some. It's going to be probably over 100 pages whenever the attorneys are done. Sources and uses, um, the, the, the distribution priority spelled out in detail, etc. So um, there are, you don't have to replicate those legal documents, but instead just put in the relevant things, which is basically um, the deal, the market, and the team the good things and any um, ways you're mitigating risk for each of those three. So just think about that way, the deal, the market, the team, what are the relevant things I need to know at the very beginning of the investment summary, have a snapshot of the opportunity with the projected returns and what their, um, what the offer is to them. So what are they investing in and then go into deal market team. Um, so number one is create that investment summary. Number two is notify, notify investors of the new deal and a conference call. Um, number three is host a conference call and send the recording to the investors afterwards. I use freeconferencecall.com. The reason why I do a conference call instead of a, a webinar is because I want it to be, well, multiple reasons. One, I want to be more of a conversation, not a presentation. I want uh, investors to be able to um, have the information they need um, in advance. That's why I send the investment summary prior to the call. And then it should be more of, a, okay, you've got the information. Now let us just talk about the deal and the opportunity. I don't want to actually present something to them. I don't want to present something to anyone. I just want to have a conversation about it, number one. Number two is with a conference call, I can be in my office in a t-shirt versus I got to dress up. I don't like dressing up. So that's, that's another reason why I do a conference call versus um, something that is uh, like a webinar or something like that. Uh, and then the, so one investment summary two notify investors of a new deal and host the conference and, and of the conference call three is host a call. I do free conference call.com and then you can record it, make sure you record it and send out a link to the recording afterwards. Um, do a Q&A session at the end of the call too with investors. That way you answer all their questions and others can hear the questions that are being asked and the responses. Number four is secure commitments. Uh, obviously, right? You got to secure the commitments and how you do that is you um, just tell them first come first serve. And then um, at the beginning of Ashcroft, I had to uh, follow up with investors because we didn't have as many investors so what I did is uh, I, I asked them at the very beginning, I said, hey, here's a deal we're doing. Um, email me or reply to this email if you'd like the investment package. That way, once they emailed me asking for the investment package, I knew who I had to follow up with if I didn't hear back from them about investing. Now, don't need to do that because we have so much demand. I can just send out the investment package in the initial email and then whoever invests, invests, and whoever doesn't, doesn't, and I don't have to follow up with anyone. Um, so at the beginning, you might have to be a little bit more, um, um, you had to be more in tune with who you're, who you're uh, in, following up with, but as your business grows and as you perform, most importantly, then you won't have to do that. Um, so that's the, that's the four-step process. Perfect. So once you've got the, 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 the capital secured, the financing, uh, secure and the due diligence performed, you close on the property. And then at that point is when you uh, implement your, your business plan. So for those remaining steps to learn more about those, purchase the book, best ever apartment syndication book, or go to apartmentsindication.com. And we've got blog posts on everything we talked about today, as well as uh, blog posts on closing and the um, asset management duties and how to sell the property at the end of your business plan. And this week still, it's the first week of launch. So when you buy it, email your receipt to info at joefairless.com and we'll get you a bunch of free goodies, which includes a, a couple eBooks. Uh, one from Gene Trowbridge, who wrote a book on syndication from a security attorney standpoint and um, a bunch of uh, templates and things like that that we send over to you. Absolutely. So besides the, the book being launched here, which is definitely a huge accomplishment. I'm very excited about this. It's been a, it's been a really fun week. One uh, year. Fun it's been week. one year too. <laughs> yes, it has been. <laughs> We've been working on this puppy for one year. Yeah, Ben. Uh, do, do you have any other um, updates? 
Uh, yeah. Well, we're, we've got a couple deals that we're working on, closing on one at the end of this month, closing on another in mid-November. Uh, then s- separate from that, I'm on, I, I play softball. I've been on a softball team, the same team for like three years. And the captain of the team, his girlfriend, is a real estate agent. And she asked me if I had any insurance um, broker contacts for a deal, a challenging deal that she's working on. And I gave her my, the person I work with and, um, she was, she contacted him and, um, because apparently she's working on a deal, it's just a, a six unit deal that, uh, had, had some insurance challenges and the seller ended up backing out. Well, it's a deal that was, that is $130,000. And, I said, you know, send me the deal and I'll, I'll forward it to someone who I know and be happy to you know, just help you out, man. That, that's it. Well, she sent it over to me. It was $130,000 is the purchase price, good condition, and the rents in total is $2,665. Two and I was like, what? <laughs> that, that, that is a, the 2% rule. I mean, that's, yeah. that, that's incredible. I was like, wait a second. Okay. This is a really, really, really good deal. So I sent it over to uh, my friend who uh, uh, he represented Colleen and I on a transaction uh, locally. And he comes to my meetup every, every month. And I've gotten, we play, we play poker uh, with our investor group every month. So I've gotten to know him really well. And I said, hey, here's a deal. If you want it, great. And you know, if you want to partner up on it, I'd be open to partnering up. And I know I've said in the past that you know, I'm not looking to do smaller stuff. But the way I structured it, so we ended up moving forward. The way I structured it with him is I'm uh, only funding the, the deal. Uh, that is my responsibility. So it's going to be about $30,000 out of pocket. I'm going to put in the deal. Um, and that's going to, you know, he's going to work on, get the loan. Obviously I'm gonna have to spend some financials for the loan and that's going to be a little bit of a hassle. But other than that, I'm passive and he is going to manage it. And the, how we structured it is it's going to be 50, 50 and the first $30,000 or whatever my final total ends up being that comes out of the property goes to me. And then after I get all my money back, then the profits are split 50, 50. And I thought that that's a good way of, of structuring it. So I'm still passive and I'm not focused on it because that's my most important you know, thing is I don't want to have focus shift from what I'm doing with apartments to something else. But if I can invest some money into a, a smoking deal um, and I can still be, remain passive and, you know, he, and by the way, he says it's worth $200,000 right now. So, um, you know, we got 70K in equity at closing. Now, I don't know, you know, plus or minus 10K or, or so, I'm, I'm sure. But um, that's a way that I'm still keeping my focus on apartment syndication and Ashcroft Capital, but then also on the side doing a deal and how I structured it, I wanted to share because perhaps other listeners who are in a similar position where they want to be, remain passive but want to still build a portfolio and you come across something or someone you know comes across something smaller, structure it that way. So essentially it's a 0% interest loan that I'm giving to the LLC that we're buying the property with. And then, um, you know, that the first money out is, it goes to me. What, um, uh, where in Cincinnati is it located? Yeah. New Richmond, which is okay. in flood territory, which is the challenge with the insurance. So we're still determining if the, the insurance is going to be a deal breaker or not. So we're not sure if we're moving forward yet, but it is under contract. And then, you know, we'll see if uh, things work out and he's working on all that stuff. I'm not, I'm not focused on any of that. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a solid deal. I mean, I'm sure the insurance is a little bit higher, but the, the gross rents are as much as the, the gross is, is about as much as the gross rents were at my fourplex, which I bought for two twenty. So yeah. Yeah. It's, it's it, I, my eyes went like, saucers whenever i saw that I was like, all right maybe it's worth a couple <laughs> conversations well congrats on that joe well we'll see we'll, we'll see what happens but i I, th- I thought it was interesting to share how i structure how we structured it so that it's a win-win for both perfect all right well to to wrap up usually we do the um best ever podcast review of the week but since it's launch week for the book i figured it'd be apt to do a book review of the week 
So uh, make sure you guys pick up, guys and girls, pick up the <laughs> a copy of the book on Amazon. Uh, it is uh, best ever apartment education book. And if you like the book and it's valuable, uh, please leave a review for your opportunity to be the review of the week to be read aloud on the podcast. Uh, the first ever book review of the week is from CEM Smiley One, who said a must read for anyone interested in syndication. And their review was this book truly goes step by step through the entire process of apartment syndication. There's a lot of information, but the material is put into layman's terms as best as can be done. And the material included within each chapter is clearly outlined, which I think will be extremely helpful for referencing. It's not necessarily an easy read due to so much info, but a must have book on your shelf if you are truly interested in getting into multifamily syndication. Well, that's my wife, so we can't use that review as a book. <laughs> oh, is it really? <laughs> yeah, that's Colleen. So Colleen, thank you for the props on that. And it is an authentic, it is an authentic review, so I'm okay telling you that's my wife. <laughs> but um, we'll use another one uh, because she did read every single word in that book and she helped us during the editing process. Let's, let's read another one. Let's read um, Ellie. Uh, great book, valuable content, exclamation mark, verified purchase is this Amazon review. And she says, I cannot recommend this book enough. I read Joe's previous books and enjoyed them a lot. This one is by far the best, all caps, one filled with valuable advice from people who made it in real estate, including the author, Joe. Step-by-step -step method to start an apartment syndication is well laid out. The book will teach you how to build your brand, team, and network. Very well written and fun to read. Already looking forward to the next, the next one. <laughs> <laughs> we, I don't know about the next one on this. This was this was a this is a year long process, um, and then and then some. Hi, hey, Ellie. Thank you so much for that thoughtful review. Really appreciate it. And Colleen, thank you so much for your thoughtful review. Really appreciate that. Um, and everyone, thanks for hanging out with us. And talk to you tomorrow.